The Georgia Archives would like to welcome everyone as we celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Georgia Department of Agriculture. The Georgia Department of Agriculture is the oldest state department of agriculture in the United States. As we celebrate and commemorate agriculture in our state's history, we can also reflect on the broad impacts it has had on our state's culture and its citizens. We are excited about the wide variety of topics during this symposium and invite everyone to explore the agricultural records held here at the Georgia Archives through our finding aids on georgiaarchives.org and by visiting us here in Morrow, Georgia. We not only house the Georgia Department of Agricultural Records, but also those from many other state agencies involved in agricultural and environmental pursuits. We would like to thank the Georgia Department of Agriculture for their cooperation in this symposium, as well as the Friends of the Georgia Archives and History and our staff members. The Georgia Archives is a unit of the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia. It identifies, collects, manages, preserves, provides access to, and publicizes records and information of Georgia and its people, and assists with state and local government agencies with their records management. Please enjoy the following session on food culture and safety. This is our last session of the day. And uh, my name is Robin Clem. I'm the Outreach Archivist here at the Georgia Archives, and I want to say thank you for all of you being here today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our final three speakers, and we'll get this um, show on the road. So our first speaker is Benjamin Prostein. Did I say that correctly? Okay, excellent. He is a PhD student in history and a presidential fellow at the University of Georgia. His research focuses on the relationships between capitalism, agriculture, and the environment in the 20th century in North America. Then we have Dr. Mark Jansen. He is the director for Center for Director of the Center for Public History and faculty in the history department at the University of West Georgia. Dr. Jansen's dissertation focused on the Cranberry Scare as a nat national phenomenon, and he enjoys researching local reactions to the events, which vary right widely. And then finally, we'll have Dr. Georgetta Connor. She is a native Romanian. Dr. Connor obtained her BS in geography at the University of Bucharest, followed by an MA in education and a PhD in geography at the University of Georgia. Since 2012, she has taught geography at Georgia Gwinnett College as an assistant and then associate professor. Um, so all of their biography, full biographies can be found in the program that you received earlier today. Um, but first, I'd like to welcome um, Benjamin Prosty. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks to the Georgia Archives and all the speakers today. I, I've been learning so much and it really makes me even start rethinking the talk I'm going to be giving today. So uh, this you know, stems out of my dissertation project, which broadly speaking is a history of dairy farming and the dairy industry in the 20th century United States. So I tend to focus on kind of the, the dairy hubs of the US, like the upper Midwest and um, California, for example. But since I am doing my studies in, in, at UGA, I have kind of taken this little digression into what dairy farming has looked like in Georgia and, and other parts of the South. Um, so we're kind of getting a snapshot of, of where I am at with that research right now. And we'll talk about what the cows are, are eating in this picture. It's I don't know if anybody recognizes that plant, but <laughs> but it will be revealed in time. So uh, so my research started at uh, Special Collections at the University of Georgia, and it kind of started in a strange place. I was reading these research reports that involved uh, the Dairy Science Department at UGA, it involved the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And it involved the prison farm at this uh, maximum security facility in Reedsville, Georgia. And so these reports were from the 1950s. And it was part of this project um, of sort of improving the dairy herds of the South through modern breeding methods. And so they were specifically importing um, frozen bull semen from Madison, Wisconsin, and using it to artificially inseminate the cows on this prison farm. 
And, and so at the time, artificial insemination was kind of this new technology, and that's a really weird and wild history that I don't really have time to go into here. But it was interesting because they're kind of taking, you know, these perceived better dairy genetics from like the, the hub of dairy production, Wisconsin, and trying to bring them into the dairy herds of the South. So that same day, I also started looking at um, pamphlets published by Georgia Extension during the same period, the 1950s. And what I was learning from these uh, various pamphlets was they were kind of toiling this story of, of sort of this story of progress in Georgia agriculture, right? Um, and they were talking specifically about sort of the diverse diversification of crop production. And so for this image there, they were specifically talking about the expansion of grassland farming. And so you have a dairy herd, once again, pictured grazing there. And so you kind of got this impression of kind of a large expansion of, of uh, grassland, of forage crops, of increasing milk production. They once again highlighted the importance of artificial insemination um, and, and how this was important uh, for generating wealth for dairy farmers, but they are also connecting it to, to health too, which I'll talk about in a little bit more. So the, the question I was trying to answer is, you know, what was driving this process and, and what did it mean to kind of take this model of dairy farming that developed in uh, the North, like upstate New York and uh, the upper Midwest, and kind of adapt it to Georgia with its subtropical ecology and also a social system based around, you know, Jim Crow segregation. So I started looking at the 1920s and I was looking at a lot of documents from extension agents and agronomists and so forth. And you get this impression that Georgia agriculture is really in this kind of period of crisis. And, and it's not just a single crisis, but kind of like a, a whirlwind of crisis. So they're dealing with the bull weevil, right, which arrived in 1915. It's really starting to decimate cotton yields by the 1920s. A lot of people are talking about, you know, soil erosion and soil degradation, which has been going on for generations in Georgia through monocrop cotton production. And there's also a lot of anxiety about the migrations that are taking place in the South, whether you know it's the great migration of black Southerners or even the sort of intra migration from rural to urban areas. And so what's interesting though, is that they're talking about commercial dairy farming as one way out of the, out of the crisis and kind of looking to kind of the, the, the dairy regime, the dairy model that existed in places like Wisconsin and upstate New York as one way of making that happen. So I think it's important to talk about that for a second, sort of. Um, so by the 1920s, you've kind of have this sort of industrial model of dairy farming that's emerged in, in parts of the U.S. And for those of you that are familiar with, you know, progressivism, like the progressive era of the first two decades, a lot of the values of that are, are really attached to kind of this development of the dairy industry. They really understand in places like Wisconsin, dairy farming to be capital P progressive. And, you know, they talk about how, you know, scientific management, it's being applied to improve soils, to improve cows, to improve crop yields. Like, it's very much this narrative of progress. Uh, and they're also connecting it to, like, soil conservation as well. So dairy farming, um, it, it depends on, you know, permanent pastures instead of annual crops. There's crop rotation. You're collecting all that manure and putting it back on the land to restore soil fertility. So it's kind of part of that uh, rhetoric as well. But I think it's also important to talk about how that kind of idea of scientific management that, that's highlighted by progressivism, it's also like colliding and overlapping with the scientific racism of the period. So this one image I have is a farm uh, in Wisconsin between the, the two world wars and the silo is kind of, that's like one of the icons of sort of progressive dairy farming. And then in this other image, this is from the dairy exhibit at Chicago's World Fair. You can see how it's starting to kind of suggest some of that scientific racism that's also kind of circulating at this time period, talking about how, you know, dairy products build superior people. And we have this this image of a kind of normative, uh, you know, white family and for some reason in classical attire. Uh, but I, I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but I think it's important to highlight how there are these kinds of connections between the scientific management of like a white substance milk and also this kind of high tide of sort of 
sado-scientific racism, you know, like embodied by eugenics and these kinds of uh, fantasies of white supremacy and so forth. But so, so as I mentioned, you know, there's this idea of dairy farming as one way out of Georgia's agricultural crisis. But what did dairy farming actually look like in Georgia in the 1920s? And so this is an interesting map from 1925. Uh, it's tracking kind of the density of dairy cows in the United States. You can obviously tell where the, the big areas of dairy production are, um, upper Midwest, um, upstate New York. But, you know, there's quite a few dairy cows in Georgia during this time period. Um, I believe almost 400,000 dairy cows were counted by the USDA census. And you can see most of them are kind of in the, the, the northern half of, of the state. But to sort of agronomists and extension agents, you know, these dairy cows, they they weren't serving the market, which is what they wanted, right? They were more often serving the household. So they were either parts of kind of a, a subsistence um, practices, or if it was part of, of a kind of business enterprise, it was usually like a sideline enterprise, like farm-made butter, which, which is really intriguing to me. Because at, at this point, like in places, like Minnesota and Iowa, which are kind of known as the butter states during this time period, all that butter production is happening off the farm and creameries, but you still have millions of pounds of farm-made butter being produced um, throughout the South, and that would continue into the 1930s. And so it kind of seems like it, it would take a, a bigger crisis to kind of open up the doors in a way to let um, Georgia agriculture diversify and let a kind of industrial commercial form of dairy farming take hold. And so the Great Depression, right, is, is a big part of that, that shift in dynamics. So the Great Depression, you know, ushers in this sort of dramatic expansion of state intervention through Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal and has huge impacts on agriculture in the South. And just kind of hitting the highlights here, but like the Agricultural Adjustment Act, you know, it's paying cotton farmers to take land out of cotton production some of that land goes into grassland. Some of that land, it, it seems, also goes into um, dairy farming. And then you also have, you know, the institutionalization of, of soil conservation. The soil conservation services are established during this time period, and they really see the South as, as a sort of key focal point of, of reform. So we have Providence Canyon uh, depicted here. And even though the, the soil erosion at Providence Canyon, it arose out of very special local conditions, it was still kind of held up as almost this poster child of sort of soil erosion in the South. And, and as I mentioned, right, dairy farming during this time period was really thought in the same breath with, with soil conservation. Also, so th there's a big expansion too in federal funding for agricultural experiment stations in the South. And that was really important for kind of getting sort of livestock research projects off the ground, more researchers trying to figure out like, how do we make dairy farming work efficiently in the South? And this is also the time period of uh, another institutional development would be the establishment of the Dairy Science Department at, at UGA. That was around 1940, 1941, when that department was established. So they would be doing, once again, furthering that, that development of how to make dairy farming work in the South. And then once again, yeah, World War II, another sort of expansion of state intervention and, and sort of the food production is a big part of the war effort. And from some of the sources I could tell, so UGA's Dairy Science Department, it's established right before the U.S. enters World War II. And they talk about how their first project wasn't really research or holding classes. It was actually feeding um, the militia um, men that were that were housed on UGA's campus. So trying to up milk production, right, so they could feed soldiers. OK, where am I at? So, OK, we get to the post-war period, and at this point, it seems that there's sort of enough knowledge, there's enough research, there's enough state intervention, state institutions that they kind of have this model for how to make dairy farming work in places like Georgia. So once again, I'm returning that question of, you know, what does this ecologically mean in a sort of subtropical climate like Georgia? And also, what does it mean, you know, socially? Uh, 
when we still have the persistence of Jim Crow segregation and in, in places like Georgia. So I'm going to deal with the, the ecological side of the question first. So when they're talking about how to make dairy farming work in Georgia, researchers tend to emphasize uh, Georgia's advantage of climate. So unlike dairy farms in Wisconsin and New York, they don't have to contend with long winters where they have to feed hay, right? They have a climate that's more conducive to year round grazing. But they soon learn that you can't feed cows year round on the kind of pastures that develop in Georgia. And so they start uh, experimenting with planting different kinds of plant species at different times of the year so they can extend the grazing season as much as possible. This is what modern grazers would call like a forage chain. So what the cows are grazing here is kudzu, right? So this is an entire field grown for kudzu. And I, I'm sure many people have seen it like engulfing hillsides, right? And climbing up trees. But it was introduced partly to reduce soil erosion in Georgia, but also to feed cows. You know, it's kind of grown at a more uh, immature state here. It kind of looks like peas or soybeans, but yeah, that, that's a whole field of kudzu. Those are Hereford cows or Holstings. Right, I think the name was um, Hereford. It was actually, yeah, it's, that's a good, good catch. But yeah, Hereford was the name, I think, of the farmer. Uh, and then also these soil conservation plans. Uh, this is one from a, a dairy farmer based out of Watkinsville, Georgia, J. Phil Campbell, who uh, J. Phil Campbell Jr., which interestingly enough, he would become the undersecretary of agriculture in the, the Nixon and Ford administrations, but he used to run a, a dairy farm. And you can see like the number of, uh, of different crops he's growing here. So you can see he's got, you know, all these acres devoted to kudzu, to, clover to alfalfa to these different species of laspidaza. He's growing barley, oats, and wheat. And from what I've gathered from other research, he was probably not growing those grain crops for grain. He was probably using them for, for cow feed. That was a common way of sort of extending the, the grazing season, was growing those grain crops as a form of forage. All right, so where are we at? So this is kind of what Dairy farming um, in Georgia is sort of, you know, a snapshot of what it's looking like right after the end of World War II. And you can see the majority of dairy farms are, are, are established in the Piedmont area and also kind of in the northwest part of the state. Not as much happening in the coastal plain, which is interesting because the coastal plain is now one of the, the biggest producers of milk in Georgia are from uh, uh, coastal plain counties. And something that I want to, you know, dive into uh, deeper with this, but I haven't had a chance to, is in this map, if you can see, they're talking about how the source of the information is coming from subsidy payments from the Agricultural Adjustment Act. So I, I'm very curious of, of how that, what kind of data they were working with when they put this map together. But as I noted before, it kind of implies that some of those AAA subsidies that farm owners were uh, earning through the New Deal programs, those are being utilized to establish dairy herds and, and kind of the former part of the cotton belt. Okay, so that's kind of the ecological uh, part of the story, right? Sort of pasture-based uh, dairy farming in Georgia. But what about the social side of it? Who becomes uh, dairy farmers after World War II? And this is something I, I want to look at more specifically, but the kind of snapshot I've gotten, and it's not a huge surprise, but it appears that where we're seeing the largest increases in pasture and forage crops and the number of cows, it's among white landowners, right? So this is something, the sort of opportunities to become a dairy farmer, they weren't really available to small scale dairy, small scale farmers, people who own small plots of land, because usually to have economic viability as a dairy farmer usually had to be milking at least 10 cows and, um, you know, having acreages beyond, you know, 40 acres, for example. And then we also think about the fact that, you know, it's been noted earlier today, kind of the racial discriminatory practices of a lot of these New Deal programs. You know, the fact too that places like UGA, they were still, uh, you know, a segregated institution, sort of excluding black people from the courses and the knowledge that was being produced there. So to kind of return then to that 
you know, that story I initially got by looking at those extension pamphlets that kind of tells the story of, you know, Georgia agriculture diversifying and progressing through, you know, forward thinking farmers and scientific research. It's obviously a bit more complex complex than that, right? That the scientific development of dairy farming, it didn't really happen in a vacuum, right? And that these dynamics of state intervention and of race and of ecology all kind of play a role in this process. And just one final note to kind of get a glimpse of what dairy farming looks like in Georgia today, I, I find these figures really fascinating. So at, in 1945, at the end of World War II, there were 160,000 farms reporting dairy cows in Georgia, and that amounted to 300,000 dairy cows in the state, producing over 1 billion pounds of milk. We flash forward to 2022, there are now 72,000 uh, dairy cows on just over 300 farms, uh, and they produce over 2 billion pounds of milk. So there's been, you know, in about, you know, 75, 80 years, a dramatic drop, right, in the number of farms with dairy cows, a dramatic drop in the number of, of dairy cows themselves, but a dramatic increase, right, in, in the milk production. And that comes back to kind of these agribusiness pro, uh, processes like artificial insemination and, and confinement feeding, right? There's been a big shift away from that pasture model of dairy farming. All right, thank you everybody. Yeah. Almost had it, <laughs> sorry guys. There we go. All right, now we have Dr. Mark Jansen. Thank you. So, um, uh, so my talk is uh, maybe a little bit of a departure, um, uh, uh, but since since we're talking about our dissertations, um, uh, uh, my my uh, uh, my dissertation uh, ultimately uh, focused on the cranberry scare of 1959, um, uh, and. Uh, you don't need the whole story about how how that ultimately came about, but um, uh, the idea is that uh, essentially the cranberry scare, and I'll give you some more of the details, um, is essentially the first. We're all used to food scares, right? We're all used to uh, food sensitivity. We're used to uh, being concerned with exactly what is in, on, et cetera, our food. Um, uh, but that's not always been the case. Um, and uh, uh, the cranberry scare of 1959 is the first time this really sort of came to a head in uh, the American uh, uh, population um, for uh, for uh, a number of reasons. And so that's that's essentially, I chose it. My, my specialty is in science and, and um, uh, technology uh, within history. Um, and I chose it because one of the science technology themes that informs, uh, uh, informs this topic. So um, you all know cranberries. Well, seen cranberries. Um, uh, uh, cranberries are grown in bogs. Um, uh, they, well, they're called bogs. It's usually wet ground, uh, lower, uh, lower um, uh, territory. Um, they're usually large pits. Lots of stuff grows here, right? Uh, lots of things really, really love to grow there. Um, uh, and essentially one of, if not the most difficult thing that cranberries, cranberry growers have to deal with is weeds. Um, so a whole variety of different things, including poison ivy and, and uh, a bunch of other things, grow in the same environments and they will compete with cranberries. And of course, if you're growing cranberries, you don't want things competing. And so herbicides um, are really important uh, in many circumstances to uh, cranberry growing. And then of course, you guys have all seen the, the things when cranberries are ripe, um, uh, you disturb the plants, you flood the bog, and the cranberries float, and you just scoop them off the surface of the water. That's how you harvest cranberries. Um, uh, but anyway, in this environment, especially in the environment on the right-hand side, herbicides are very important, especially early on in the growing season. Um, uh, so what's going on during this time period? 
um, uh, cranberries are grown in regions where they thrive naturally. Um, that is not Georgia, <laughs> by the way. Um, uh, the natural growing cranberry region of the United States does extend all the way into Tennessee. And technically, the very northern part of Georgia could grow cranberries. There may actually be a couple plants somewhere, um, but I don't believe they were ever commercially viable in Georgia, uh, really, uh, at all. 1950 year and 1958, 57 and 58, as a matter of fact, were banner year with a particular problem. Um, cranberry production was growing enormously. In 1958 alone, they saw 28% growth in production, um, accompanied with zero growth in demand. And that's that's an obvious problem, right? Um, uh, so year after year, they're ending up with literally warehouse loads of frozen cranberries from the previous year when they're harvesting next year's crop, right? Um, uh, so there's all kinds of different things uh, occurring uh, to figure that out. Ocean spray, which we're all uh, used to, uh, uh, accommodated about 70% uh, of the market at this particular point, was looking for other ways to utilize and grow and uh, deal with that surplus. At the same time, this is all concurrence of events. In 1958, they passed a food additives amendment to um, the um, uh, food legislation to the FDA. Um, uh, and the food additives amendment had a clause. It's called the Delaney clause. And my, my dissertation was actually titled the beginning of the end of the Delaney clause. So in 1958, they passed this additive amendment and specifically the amendment said uh, that um, uh, foods in intended for human consumption cannot contain any percentage any residue of any chemical be it herbicide um, uh, uh, fertilizer whatever that can be shown to cause cancer no residue whatsoever. Uh, there were uh, uh, zero tolerances applied to that. Um, uh, that means if they can detect a residue, it can't be used for food, right? Okay, so that's that's sort of uh, helping to set the stage. Uh, 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 you also have public perception of cancer at this particular point. Um, 1952 was the first time uh, the uh, Surgeon General had finally come out and linked cancer specifically to smoking. The rise of cancer uh, uh, in the medical field is going up and up, and there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of growing concern over cancer itself. So a law that bans something because it causes cancer is going to generate uh, uh, anxiety, right? Um, here's our main actors, um, uh, Arthur Fleming, Secretary Arthur Fleming is the Secretary of the uh, Department of Health, Education and Welfare. Um, uh, and the chemical um, uh, in uh, under consideration here is aminotriazole, uh, and that's its that's its chemical chemical formula. Um, aminotriazole actually is an excellent herbicide. All of the cranberry growers that I talked to when I was doing my research for my dissertation and everything said it's the best herbicide there has ever been. None of the ones that have come out since really do as much as effectively uh, as this chemical um, uh, ever did. So um, uh, fast forward just a little bit, uh, November 9th, 1959. Now there's a lot of preamble to this. Um, uh, health, education, and welfare knew that there were cranberries that had some uh, residues on them. They had gone to Ocean Spray and some of the others to try and get something uh, going, um, but they sort of preempted anything that the uh, cranberry growers might do by announcing this. So it's November 9th, just before Thanksgiving, obviously, right? Um, uh, 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 Secretary Fleming announces, um, despite many requests for, for him to withhold this information, um, announces that um, uh, 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 cranberries from uh, the uh, Northeast um, had been uh, found to have some of these residues, some of this aminotriazole. Um, and he, he goes into a little bit of the science and all this sort of thing. I should note um, uh, one of the technology components that I uh, tried to uh, lean on is television. Television is starting to become uh, uh, a primary means of people gathering information at this particular point. Um, uh, and this is televised. 
Um, uh, and he, so he goes through the stuff, can, you know, cancer causing, the, uh, the uh, food additives amendment, all of that sort of thing. At a particular point, he is asked, and I, I and this is not a quote, but this is similar to what's asked. And somebody asked him, and how is the American housewife to know what cranberries are and are not safe? And his response is, they can't know. And ultimately, that uh, comment in and of itself generates so much anxiety, so much fear. Um, uh, uh, in large uh, 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 throughout the United States, that it essentially creates the scare, the first uh, major food scare. So you have immediate federal and national reactions, um, uncertainty over all of these things leads to confusion, confusion leads to fear. Um, uh, grocery stores take stuff off of their shelves, um, uh, large scale um, uh, shipping and um, uh, distribution issues. Um, but the interesting part for me, um, uh, that's that's essentially my dissertation, right? The 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 body of what occurred. But for me, what's interesting is moving around the United States for uh, uh, the the past couple decades. I go to different states. I'm always interested to find out what happened in different states. Um, uh, I know what happened nationally, and I know what caused it, what ultimately the resolution of some of these things were. But I'm interested in individual states because it varies widely, it varies surprisingly uh, in, in different places, depending on factors that I'm not always um, uh, certain of. So um, there's a few headlines. Cranberries may produce cancer. Uh, United States warned some cranberries care cancer causing producing agent, that sort of thing. Eventually, they come up with this long, convoluted plan to test cranberries in all of these lots because there's thousands of cranberry producers, right? It's not just Ocean Spray. Ocean Spray is a cooperative of hundreds and hundreds of cranberry producers. So each one has to be tested. Each one has to be uh, uh, set up in lots. There's labeling. There's all these labels, and it's illegal for you to buy or sell cranberries that are not properly labeled. But, I mean, it, it goes crazy. Anyway, okay. Um, uh, there's even alternatives, right? Oh, it's like, what? You can't get cranberries? Try aspic instead, right? I mean, they, they go into all of these different. It's it's actually really, uh, and so there's all sorts of accusations. Government did this, and you know, the, the whole process was bungled. And um, anyway, so. Immediate reactions. Um, uh, let me see if I can get this to. Oops, hold on. Oh. Is it going to do it? Just yes. Okay. Mr. Stevens, what is the trend very Well, I, I, I wired the secretary of health, education, and welfare this morning. And I meant every word I put in a while. Maybe I might just read a few words of it. I say this. In justice to thousands of cranberry growers and distributors and business consumers, we demand that you make immediate steps to rectify the incentive of the cranberry industry caused by your administration and the government of the yesterday. Unless this is done without delay, you will cause damage to the trends of many farmers and great damage to the fine American industry and all unnecessarily. You are killing our thoroughbred in order to destroy our peace. Well, ocean spray produces 75% of these crops. Now, what about the other 25%? Can you speak for them? Uh, I'm sorry to say I cannot speak for others because I don't have the facts. I only talk to all the legal facts. And that's the important part, right? Mm -hmm. This is uh, uh, this is uh, Mr. Olson, I forget his first name, um, who's head of Ocean Spray. Uh, and he does exactly the same thing Fleming does. He can say for certainty, and later on they find uh, some Ocean Spray has a metatriazole on it too, but he can say for certain uh, that Ocean Spray is safe. But the other 25%, I can't know. And there's no way for the consumer to know whether it's ocean spray or not, right? And so that sort of uncertainty is what ultimately generates this, this problem. Okay, let's see if I can go back to where I was. Oh, it's a separate one. Ah, I got it. Okay. Um, uh, so you get all of these drawn out uh, um, uh, sorts of things. There's another video of 
uh, of uh, Secretary Fleming talking about uh, some of the issues, and, and they do the same kind of thing. Um, ultimately, cranberries are withdrawn from store shelves. Millions, literally millions of pounds of cranberries are destroyed in some circumstances. It's like a mass grave. They dig these giant pits and just fill them up with cranberries and then bury them. There's in, in several places around the United States, there's uh, essentially giant uh, uh, cranberry uh, uh, infill. Um, uh, market and producers are hit really hard by this, especially since um, at this point, um, uh, uh, cranberries are used pretty much at Thanksgiving and Christmas, either fresh or canned. And so for this to happen just before Thanksgiving in 1959 uh, really uh, hits the um, hits the uh, uh, the uh, 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 field pretty hard. Um, uh, this is one of the interesting things that I, I look at. Um, uh, one of the ways that they combat this um, uh, in terms of the visual, in terms of the cranberry industry, industry sort of indicating uh, cranberries are okay, you can eat cranberries, is they show people eating cranberries. There's Nixon, um, they even get Secretary um, uh, 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 Fleming to eat cranberries. Um, on the uh, right, uh, we have Olson, the gentleman who was on the video just a second ago, eating cranberries. Um, on the left is a Republican candidate uh, here in Georgia um, uh, who uh, was um, uh, uh, for one position or other who's eating cranberries. Um, so that whole notion of eating them is safe. Look, Nixon is eating them. Look, Kennedy's eating them. It's got to be OK, right? That's we're trying to alleviate those fears. Um, uh, Long term impact. Um, it took about eight years for the cranberry industry to uh, bounce back. Um, uh, and from this day, right, from uh, the first articles that appear in the newspapers, you get a strong impetus to change that Delaney Clause. So when, when I was looking into the Delaney Clause, there was a lot of controversy over its passage in the first place um, uh, over scientific reasons and specifically for that lack of tolerances. Um, uh, 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 and it will eventually be repealed, which is part of the point of my dissertation uh, in 1996 uh, with the Food Quality Protection Act. Um, uh, you do end up with a lot of alternative products. This is what Ocean Spray was working on at the time, right? Things like craisins. Um, we have, I think, you know, if you, if you if you go out and look, there's a there's actually a significant percentage of products on our store shelves that have cranberry juice in them, right? Anything has juice has a little bit of cranberry juice in it, and this is why, right? This is the time period where that starts up. And you start having cranberry juice, cran everything, cran apple, cran peach, whatever, right? That sort of thing. OK, so the Georgia response, this is what was entry. I wanted to find out what was going on. So I started looking into um, uh, this institution's uh, records um, uh, in terms of uh, newspapers and farm reports and all of that sort of thing. Um, uh, this occurs right at the switchover between uh, Governor uh, Griffin and Governor Vandiver. So I thought, oh, sure, they're going to have a file on it, right? Um, uh, we've got uh, Phil Campbell, who's probably is it the same guy? OK, um, uh, uh, is the uh, agricultural commissioner at the time, right? I thought, oh, yeah, he's going to have a whole folder on this, right? Because he's in a number of uh, newspaper articles and stuff like that. Um, uh, there's nothing in the governor files at all that I can find. Um, uh, even uh, uh, Ag Commissioner uh, Campbell doesn't have a specific file on it, like he was collecting things, right? And to me, this indicates relative unimportance. Um, there are no uh, House or Senate uh, resolutions that I could find. Um, uh, annual agricultural laboratory tests briefly mentioned. It. Um, uh, so the state did test 75 samples of cranberries, probably dutifully doing what the federal government asked them to do. All of them were found to be perfectly clear. They reported that. The only one that didn't pass didn't pass because its labeling said it was dietetic. And the definition of dietetic is incorrect, right? So they it was it had nothing to do with it being cancer causing. It was mislabeled, right? Um, so they found uh, uh, no problems uh, uh, with any of that. So 
the place that I find most of the information is going to be in the newspapers. And the newspapers reported this event, the sequence of events, which goes all the way through late 1960, um, uh, 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 pretty widely. So you see pretty consistent articles. And they do appear um, uh, in Atlanta newspapers. Um, there are lots of them, but they are far less incendiary. I noted some of those other articles. Those are New Jersey. Those are Northeast and Northwest newspapers for the most part that are reporting that um, uh, in very um, uh, sort of in your face <coughs> uh, incendiary ways. In Georgia, um, uh, they are uh, uh, anything but um, uh, uh, the most of the articles are very uh, essentially make it very clear that this is not a problem. Um, uh, and some of the information that comes directly from um, uh, Ag Commissioner um, Campbell um, uh, is an a indicator of that. Let's see here. Control click. It's that one. See what happens. So. Can do it. No, maybe not. OK. Minimize screen. Oh, maybe maybe is it the minimize screen? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Minimized. No, it's okay. So, um, uh, one of the things um, uh, that I came across is um, okay. So we have the annual agricultural report. We had the seventy-five samples. Other states uh, that I've come across typically go into a lot more detail. Some of them even find aminotriazole. They talk about what uh, versions of the processes they used, all of that sort of thing. Um, uh, they did not um, uh, do that. The only note that I uh, came across was that the uh, lab was using paper chromatography. You guys know chromatography is a, you, you look at uh, the color variation in something to determine what it contains. Um, so paper chromatography, you use paper to do that, distribution of chemical through paper. They wanted to buy some new equipment so that they could acquire a brand new gas chromatograph, right? Which would be much higher level of ability to determine uh, the material. That's as a direct result of what's going on um, uh, because that's ultimately what drives the, uh, the scare. With the Delaney Clause, it can't pass if there's even any degree of uh, contamination, one part in a billion, one part in a trillion, it doesn't make any difference. The Delaney class says, no, you can't use that material. Well, what if your technology is improving at the same time? And at the beginning of the, the scare, you can detect one part in a million. At the end of the scare, by middle 1960s, they're detecting one part in 10 trillion. And they can still detect aminotriazole. As a matter of fact, what it turns out, they're detecting aminotriazole that was sprayed on a field a half mile away from the cranberries, right? Um, and so it's that kind of thing. Those kinds of things ultimately are what drive that technology change is what drives this uh, problem. Um, uh, Atlanta Daily World uh, reports this pretty consistently. Um, but one of the interesting things that I note um, throughout these articles, especially from uh, Phil Campbell initially, right at the very beginning, um, uh, is that they go through um, uh, and they note the scientific elements of this, right? Um, uh, in a lot of parts of the United States, they go with the fear. They go with the, the stress and the cancer and, oh my gosh, this is terrible. In Georgia, they went with the science and they said right off the beginning, right from the very beginning, this is BS. This is junk science. This is not going to cause cancer. This is not going to hurt you Georgians. Don't worry about it. Right from the very beginning, they quashed it. Um, uh, and it's very clear when you're doing the, the, the uh, ag lab, didn't care. They did 75 samples. They probably weren't even looking for aminotriazole, right? Um, uh, uh, all of that sort of thing. Eventually, they bring in doctor's reports. They bring in a variety of different things to demonstrate that this is not a problem that you need to be worrying about, right? So uh, uh, Georgia, for some reason, and so this is the interesting part to me as a researcher, um, 
Uh, they called it irresponsible. They brought in American uh, American Medical Journal. It says, nope, this is not a problem. This is not a risk, right? All of that sort of thing. Um, so as a researcher, what's interesting to me is that variation in response. Um, uh, and I'm not 100% sure yet. I need to do some more research to try and figure out why Georgia responded significantly differently. Some of you might be able to help me. I'm thinking at the time, the population of Georgia was about 4 million people, um, so significantly more rural than some of the other areas I'm looking at. So perhaps information transmission was slower. Maybe there was some sort of communication issue um, that kept that, uh, uh, that fear response down a little bit. Um, uh, obviously, no cranberries are grown in Georgia, so maybe there's just no stake in the game, right? Um, um, uh, I'm also curious as to the prevalence of cranberries um, in the South, right? Um, are cranberries a part of the traditional core culinary um, experience in the South at this time? If it's not, then it wouldn't have that much impact, right? Where in other parts of the country, it was a central core component. So to be removed from Thanksgiving, um, uh, I did several oral histories as part of my um, uh, uh, dissertation, um, and I found all kinds of people throughout the time period who were old enough to remember this event remember there being no cranberries for that Christmas. Um, and so that experience of that, they don't remember the fear, they don't remember the cancer, they remember no cranberries, right? Um, uh, and so, um, uh, so I don't have enough information to say uh, exactly why. Other than that, the leadership of Georgia stepped up and simply quashed it before it became a problem in Georgia. So I find, I find that even uh, particularly interesting um, uh, at the time. Um, in addition to the fact that television was one of the major vectors of this, of spreading that information, and I'm not certain how prevalent uh, television ownership was in 1959 throughout Georgia. So that initial November 9th, uh, it would have spread through newspapers, but that spread slower and it had already been quashed by the leadership and by the newspapers by that time. So there were there were perhaps fewer people that saw it on the news, saw it on TV and went, oh, you know, and you had the fear reaction. Maybe that simply didn't occur. So anyway, that was uh, that what I, was what I was looking into. And I find that particularly fascinating. Thank you. I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you do the thing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And now we have Dr. Georgetta Connor. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I am uh, the second time presenting uh, something from my uh, research, one of them being agriculture. Now, in addition of uh, teaching or doing research, including agriculture and food, I had some connection since my born in a village in uh, which uh, in Romania, in which my fa my uh, grandfather from my mother's side was farmer. Therefore, I was uh, working a little uh, um, with my grandfather uh, in, on uh, in his farm. And then uh, studying um, in a college history geography, and then moving to the University of Bucharest studying ge geography geology. In both institutions, I had to study agriculture. And then, uh, in even though in my PhD in Romania, I was focusing on uh, urban, uh, at the University of Georgia, I uh, decided to work on um, Romania integration into the European Union, focusing on uh, rural development and agriculture. Uh, why? I was thinking, uh, and for all Eastern Europe under the Soviet Union umbrella, 
um, agriculture was collectivized and uh, starting after so-called Eastern European Revolution, uh, agriculture, uh, the farmer, the people received their land back and it was a very difficult time for moving from centralized economy to so-called free um, uh, um, economy under the European Union. And uh, uh, teaching geography during my PhD at the University of Georgia, then to uh, Gainesville State College between 2008-2012, and after 2012 at uh, Georgia Gunnett College, we have to teach agriculture and food. And um, the system, the University of Georgia system encouraged us, a professor, to write the textbook in order to save students for not paying the textbook. And I am, I have two chapters. Uh, one, it's agriculture and food in our uh, 2018 chap uh, textbook. And yesterday we received uh, the second ALG grant, $10,000 for all, only to revise our textbook. My uh, uh, agriculture and food chapter is already revised. Too big, probably I have to work a lot to dig it. <laughs> okay, now uh, teaching any chapter, including agriculture, I have a number of case studies. And for agriculture already, all, always I selected um, this topic, slow food, uh, is a case study for students. I did not eat fast food until 54 years. This was a situation in Eastern Europe. But um, one student asked me, do you eat now fast food? And I told him, if I will starve, yes, I will live. Um, it's a significant difference, according to the slow food movement, between Europe and the United States. Here is a lot of focus on fast food. When GMO was introduced in Europe, it was a big scandal. Uh, a scandal means every food without labels must be in Europe. You cannot find food without labels to be specified is or not GMO there. Why? Because uh, 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 European Union especially consider people uh, are uh, the right to know what to eat. If they want to eat GMO, it's their problem, not the government problem. Therefore, I always have Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, next week, I had agriculture uh, to teach um, geography 1101, and uh, the students have to present their research to compare Europe and uh, uh, the United States uh, is for GMO. And in my research, writing this chapter, I discovered a lot of countries from Africa. Uh, having um, mandatory labeling for food is or not contaminated with GMO. Now, um, it's a, a big problem. Can be uh, uh, the food is considered um, very healthy, but uh, if you go to Publix, if we, I go, many times. And uh, uh, organic uh, tomatoes are four dollars and something only half or one pound, or um, for many people is a little too expensive. Def but remain to see. There are many factors to decide uh, to select this or not. Um, why um, this uh, movement? Um, According to um, my research, the um, uh, slow food movement 
started in uh, uh, Italy, in northern Italy. I would like to understand it short thing or not. Yes. In northern Italy, a city, smaller town probably, called Bra, near Turin, Torino in Italian language. Um, and then uh, from uh, that place started to uh, extend um, in uh, many European countries and other around the globe, including the United States. Uh, why? Uh, very important uh, is um, uh, the tendency to preserve traditional and regional cuisine and then um, uh, um, re trying to resist this debate between uh, slow food, uh, uh, accepting only organic uh, uh, food and uh, fast food, which is generalized in many countries. Um, the uh, slow food uh, uh, movement also focusing on uh, sustainability of the environment and um, uh, for this reason, uh, in many places, including North Georgia, which I study a little, uh, creating some branches, or so-called uh, convivia in um, um, Italy. In, um, Um, in uh, doing this re research, I try to uh, find the answer for those questions. What is a slow food movement in, uh, and uh, what are its main goals? How slow food movement has developed in the United States? What local chapters exist in North Georgia? And what are the benefits? Of the slow food movement and how it's perceived in the United States. Now, I ask my students to express their hypothesis doing their research. In my case, uh, I can hypothesize that the slow food movement will relieve uh, some of the dependency on mass agriculture due, due to the current development of more family farms, smaller. I can also expect an increase in food prices if the organic food will dominate the American market. And lastly, I have hypothesized the slow food movement will protect family value as well as the traditions to the more family time being spent together over more family meals. <laughs> Uh, here it's explained a little um, details uh, background of slow food uh, as uh, I specified uh, here. Uh, slow food was created uh, in uh, Italy, the um, city of Bra. Carlo Petrini is the founder of uh, uh, cities near Turin, Turin or Torino in uh, Italy. Uh, that began with an attempt to resist opening of McDonald near the ste Spanish steps in the, eight, the 18th century historical monument in Rome. This was the first establishment part of the broader, broader uh, slow uh, movement. Uh, I selected uh, these goals to counteract fast food flavorless. I'm sorry, this is an European opinion about American food and fast uh, life to promote the unholy pleasure of the table, healthy eating. Three, to protect the traditional food and agricultural biodiversity and to protect against globalization, environmental degradation and mass production. And then uh, uh, the movement extended and you can see several examples um, in uh, 1989 in France. They uh, continued uh, um, on, uh, uh, a festival uh, which was 
very important event in Bra called Manifesto of the International Slow Food Movement. Um, uh, or, uh, it was pretty important because there were 15 countries uh, participating there. And then um, other um, uh, branches and other countries, cities in the countries uh, started to um, uh, uh, go uh, uh, on with uh, this uh, movement. In uh, 2002, for example, um, more than 400 slow food convivia or branches, uh, approximately more than 45 countries, including the United States, with over 80,000 members all over the world. And then other countries, Switzerland, Germany, uh, the United States in New York, um, later uh, 2003, France, Japan, United Kingdom, and South America, I specify here Chile. Uh, currently, the Slow Food uh, Organization has uh, expanded to include over 100,000 members with over 1,300 local convivia branches in over 150 countries. Some more details here. Um, the slow food uh, one goal is to support small scale farms, family farms in general, um, artisanal work, quality food production, and to compete to the global market slow food in the region of Piedmont and the city of Turin organized the world's largest food and wine fair. It was called Salone del Gusto in Turin, a Biennale Cheese Fair, another event uh, in Bra, then um, in Genoa Fish Festival, and very important uh, annual conferences under the umbrella, the uh, title Terra Madre. In the pictures on the left is um, uh, pictures uh, from uh, Terra Madre uh, conference in 2023, and the uh, presenter is former um, Prince Charles in that time, uh, which uh, he is uh, for uh, organic agriculture, uh, started um, after the a revolution to come to Romania, especially in Transylvania, and um, uh, is for um, uh, protecting the uh, tradition, uh, including in agriculture. I don't know if in the United States can happen, but as it, uh, this photo is from Germany. A small, medium size Oberlingen is called in which uh, it's possible fast food to be banned totally. Uh, here, there are some um, uh, officials of the town, including the restaurant. Uh, the farmers are subsidized to grow organically only. The um, restaurants are subsidized in order not to be very expensive food. And because of this war situation, when the fast food have to go from the so to move out of the town because it was better food, uh, organic, and was approximately the same price was not very expensive. And uh, there are situations when in smaller or medium size uh, town, the fast food is totally uh, not accepted. For example, I was professor in, uh, in Romania also. European Union uh, uh, um, decide no fast food in schools. For example, uh, each school has a cafeteria, something or just a little uh, store selling some food for students in uh, bra uh, uh, break, so 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. When the decision from European Union came, was uh, all cafeterias or uh, just small uh, 
um, stores selling food to the students who are obliged or to have only organic or out. That do we <laughs> I invited them out of the building. They were obliged to go far away of school building. Why? The student not to have time in 10 minutes break to go and to come back to the next class. Now, this uh, is, um, uh, is respected uh, um, in, in general, but um, especially in if you go to um, local market agriculture, if our farmers in general, it's uh, organic because it's too expensive to buy all the chemicals or something. Yeah. I remember because you know the situation with Ukraine, with the Russia, with the war, and the Romania is a more permissive country le letting them Ukraine because Poland closed the border, the Slovakia closed the border. Therefore, who remain? Ah, Hungary they did not want to hear about. Romania let uh, all. Um, uh, Ukrainian uh, grain and others to be sold in Europe or outside because of Black Sea, it's a big problem with the Russian and the Turkish decision. Uh, the information from Hungary, um, they bought uh, corn, I think, and uh, their pig refused to eat Ukrainian corn. Why? Too much chemicals. And uh, the uh, uh, Hungarian parks are very sensitive. They cannot accept. OK. Uh, therefore, um, um, uh, uh, this decision uh, for uh, organic agriculture is not easy because it's expensive. And in general, um, um, it's respected except to Ukraine because they have the sp special status. OK, to go ahead. I don't know what I did. Oh. Um, coming from Europe, uh, I was curious uh, the situation in the United States. Um, it, it, slow for the USA began in uh, 1998. A uh, very important office was, uh, was op op on, uh, in uh, New York in uh, 2000, uh, New York City. In 2008, Slow Food USA uh, encountered over 30,000 members. But not always remain like this. Uh, as a result of um, um, uh, some uh, econ economic problems, uh, in 2011 um, uh, was um, um, recorded a significant reduction in their income. Uh, wealthy supporters disappeared or were uh, less, and. Um, uh, as a result, in 2013, Slow Food USA had only 12,000 members. Uh, currently, it's organized um, in uh, 200 local chapters, or anyway, a little lower um, than uh, 2011, some of them in uh, Georgia, and uh, 2,000 uh, food community. Um, the major goals of these uh, chapters, uh, non they are non-profit uh, organization, uh, focusing more uh, including on education, um, uh, advancing the local environmental movement, encouraging the creation of urban gardens. I presented last year uh, uh, this uh, topic here. Now, Except for general vision, uh, uh, I find out I found out um, some universities were engaged in this. One of them, uh, University 
uh, Wisconsin at Madison um, uh, developed a number of projects, five projects uh, dedicated to um, the movement efforts, including family dinner night, weekly cafe, uh, and the farm to university scheme. And uh, from this, there uh, have been 46 slow food chapters established on campuses of higher education. Uh, in 2008, Slow Food uh, USA hosted um, its largest gathering to date in San Francisco. The centerpiece of the festival, um, named uh, Slow Food Nation, um, and um, uh, uh, if we think about it, uh, the two directions are important, uh, obtaining money, over two millions, uh, and um, the goal is uh, to be food, del very delicious food, uh, healthy, sustainability, produce uh, food uh, uh, and the ecological and political changes. Um, then uh, after uh, Katrina Hurricane uh, was another uh, project, um, uh, raising also money, uh, especially to uh, help the restaurant to come back after the flood. In um, October 2014, uh, the organization formed an initial 15 months partnership. Seems strange, but partnership with fast food <laughs> Mexican Grill, which saw the company finding 500,000, which is great. Um, towards Slow Food USA National School Garden Program. Consequently, 100 school gardens in different cities in the United States uh, were funded um, uh, to uh, uh, and money uh, 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 were used uh, on the one hand to teach uh, students uh, uh, how food is grown but also to teach students uh, where food uh, comes from. Now, uh, this uh, uh, some details only about the United States as a whole. In the North Atlanta, I found uh, three universities uh, in Atlanta, Emory, and the University of Georgia. Slow Food Atlanta is a local chapter that celebrate good, clean, and fair food for all in the Atlanta community. Uh, this um, chapter uh, is a member supporting the same nonprofit that work in the community for foster the preservation of diverse Southern food culture and traditions while um, education uh, and advocating uh, for local alternative to the broken industrial food system. The chapter supports and celebrate farmers, community members, and professionals working in the local food system. For this year, I was curious if it's uh, an event, and I discovered um, an event on uh, April 29, Slow, uh, Slow Food Atlanta annual meeting hosted by Southern National. Emory. A very um, uh, strong activity has uh, maybe more than Atlanta I found in my literature. Um, uh, uh, this uh, university has shown the commitment to a new sustainable food initiative to replace 75% of its food supply with local products. Slow Food uh, Emory University bears the mantra for 
good food, clean and fair for all. Therefore, fair is a little disputable because our price is uh, so far. It's pretty hard. Um, uh, promote uh, localizing the food system and uh, bringing endangered food back to the table. What does this mean? So created here in Europe is old seed banks, uh, saving the seed from endangered plants. And uh, if uh, those specialists go knocking in uh, the uh, door in the gate, asking the farmer if they want to donate some uh, local uh, seed. And they created the bank and other people wishing to change their agriculture go to the bank. They receive only 10 seeds first, free of charge, and then second year will multiply and so on. Um, when uh, uh, goods are purchasing locally, and we all can see on the shelf when we buy food, the uh, section or local food. Um, food service uh, provide travel. Why is better? Consider um, it's uh, um, if it's local, it no a lot of uh, travel, uh, driving uh, hundreds of uh, uh, miles to bring something on the shelf. Therefore, shorter distance is one aspect, less fuel. Therefore, uh, saving some imp and impact the environment um, with a cleaner uh, environment. And the third, and I think so uh, for the um, uh, greater um, uh, things, I study PhD at the University of Georgia, always, especially graduate students who are invited uh, uh, to the conferences, or to do research, or to the market, farm market, uh, centered somewhere, uh, uh, known uh, somewhere. Uh, Uh, the uh, major goals is to provide um, are to provide access to sustainable uh, sustainably produced, harvested and prepared food in the greater Athens area. Uh, it's try to educate consumers about the economic, social and health benefit of locally grown food. Uh, also brings together businesses, academic and service institution, uh, especially with um, the conference, and I attended one uh, last uh, uh, year. Um, and the last, um, uh, Athens Slow Food seeks to increase kids and parents' engagement on food, nutrition, and agriculture, serve fresh, healthy meals uh, in school cafeterias, and support small local part. And like uh, uh, in Atlanta, I found um, a local uh, event, um, uh, Georgia chapter of American Chestnut Foundation, a meeting in um, uh, May 11, uh, at the University of Georgia. In conclusion, the slow food movement is the only way to preserve the traditional culture in food. Uh, also, uh, in the negative health, what at least is thinking to do, uh, to uh, end the negative health effects caused by fast food, support local, small family, organic farms, also, um, um, environmental protection is another goal. Uh, as I specify already, uh, creation of those seed um, banks, uh, the diverse traditional plants. Without this, it's possible some plants to disappear uh, as a result of large uh, commercial farms. And the last, um, uh, it also support local small businesses by using their product rather than large 
conglomerate and the last um, uh, encourage local production of food involving knowledge and artisanal skill which are often passed down through generations um, they then create the jobs and local communities helping to benefit not only individual economic security but also advanced regional and national economic growth thank you Much uh, to take my instrument. Um, yes, here. Yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you. Very there you go. Um, yes. Thank you, everyone. Um, that concludes our April History Symposium. I want to thank all of our presenters um, that were here today. We only have a few minutes left. The archive does close at four, but I wanted to ask real quick if anybody had any questions for our last couple of presenters. Okay, <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> now, you mentioned the Daily World, which of course is the black paper. What was the Constitution doing at the same time? I mean, it's reasonable the Daily World would have a rational idea, but what's, what was the Constitution? I have, I, have, I have not thoroughly read all the newspapers to see if there's a distinction between the papers. Yeah. Most of the articles, whether it was the New York Times or New Jersey or New England or whatever, they're all AP articles because they're all coming out of Washington, D.C. And so they're all and they're distributing. So I find the same article in many different locations and I find those here in the newspapers. It's the ones generated locally that are different ones that really focus on science. Not that other places didn't engage in science. Thank you. Um, uh, but Georgia did it in a different immediate versus oh, a couple of weeks later, they're arguing about the science. Georgia turned right around and said, no, this is BS. Stop talking about this. That science should never pass that, that amendment in the first place. And they just moved on. And so you don't you don't see the same kind of discussion. I, I I could try to compare different newspaper threads and see if there's a distinction there. Well, but there's a distinction between black and white. I mean, of course, black people read the Constitution Journal, but um, it was essentially a white paper. Right. So it'll be interesting to find. It. Yeah, yeah. That 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 I, I I intend to continue looking. That's just where that's just where I've gotten so far. So. Real quick, what about companies like Lord? Um, that they certain subsidy programs play a role, but also the big companies. Yeah, I know they they established condensaries. I think in Georgia, um, I think that was a like post World War II phenomenon. I, I know there's been work done on the Warden facility that was established in uh, like Northeast Mississippi. Yeah. Alan Marks is both that land milk and money. But yeah, I mean, they're a big player. They were one of the biggest scary corporations throughout the 20th century. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No? Okay. Um, again, thank you so much for being here today. We want to thank the Georgia Department of Agriculture, uh, FOGA, as always, and the Georgia Archives staff uh, for putting this together. Um, most of these sessions have been recorded, so they will be put on YouTube later next next week, um, hopefully. And um, so if you miss them, they'll be there. And that's it for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.